At Englewood Health, we believe that all citizens need to be informed about the health care issues that affect their lives. That's why we're proud to support important health care programming produced by the Caucus Educational Corporation and their partners in public television. State of Affairs with Steve Adubato is brought to you from the Agnes Varis NJTV studio at 2 Gateway. Funding has been provided by Englewood Health, the Northward Center, Rowan University, educating New Jersey leaders, partnering with New Jersey businesses, transforming New Jersey's future, New Jersey Resources, the Healthcare Foundation of New Jersey, founded by the Jewish community. MD Advantage Insurance Company of New Jersey, and by International Union of Operating Engineers, Local 825. Welcome to State of Affairs. I'm Steve Adubato, coming to you from the Agnes Varis NJ TV studio in New York. I'm going to introduce two very special guests. Ed Richardson, Executive Director of the New Jersey Education Association, and his colleague, Marie Bliston, President of New Jersey Education Association, 200,000 members mm -hmm. strong. Correct, Marie? Yes, that's absolutely correct. Not just teachers? No. Who we else? have teachers, child study team, librarians, nurses, custodians, bus drivers, cafeteria workers, maintenance, How long is security this personnel, go on? secretaries, <laughs> for as long as it takes to answer that question. That's a yeah. lot. All of the essential yeah. people we need to run our yes. public schools. Wow, it, it's absolutely true. And by the way, I always say this when every educator, public school educator comes on. Thank you, all of you. Uh, for everything you do for our children and other children every day. Um, yeah, we're talking about a whole range of substantive important issues, mm -hmm. and let me disclose the NJA, a major underwriter of the work that we do in public broadcasting, and as you know, a big supporter of public broadcasting. Mm -hmm. um, I'm curious about this. As we do this program, and uh, toward the later and latter end of September, there's just been a deal struck between the Governor Murphy administration mm -hmm. and public employee workers having to do with, help me on this if I'm wrong, renegotiating uh, health and pension benefits, saving the state a significant amount of money. Set this up for us. So not pension benefits, but... Uh, Only health. Right. Uh, State-provided health insurance. Um, our members are in a program called the School Employees Health Benefits Program. Uh, other public employees are in another state health benefits program. So this was on the school employee side. Hold on. Communication Workers of America, they have a different... They're in the State, state Employees health. health Benefits Got it. Program. Okay. There are design committees of both of those programs, and those design committees have equal representation from uh, unions and from the administration. Uh, that design committee for the school employees program got together just yesterday and agreed to uh, changes that will, in total, save the state about $470 million over How does it say it? Explain it. Um, basically, there were a whole uh, variety of changes that were put in place to um, uh, really improve the way that care is delivered without diminishing the level of care. The big one is on the retiree side, I will say, uh, having to do with um, the uh, post-retirement medical benefits for Medicare-eligible retirees. Uh, the state bid and got a very attractive bid from uh, Aetna for a program that uh, is a Medicare Advantage program, but a much better Medicare Save Advantage money. program. Yep. Oh, yeah. Marie, let me ask you this. We had mm -hmm. uh, State Assemblyman John Bramnick, who had mm -hmm. the Republicans in the lower house, mm -hmm. and he said, you know what, that's a good thing. It's a step in the right direction, but quote, it's not saving nearly enough, you say? I say that we have come to the table whenever we have been invited to find the best affordable health care, quality health care for our members. So this is the deal that could be struck at this point. How about if someone said, go further? Well, you know, I think, public employees, you I, say? I, I think people have to remember that we did go further. Mm -hmm. um, Back in 2011? We, uh, no, not even. A couple of years ago, we came to the state and said, you know what? We've done some research. We believe that the way that the state is bidding the prescription benefits in these programs uh, could be dramatically improved. They took our advice. There was legislation that needed mm -hmm. to be passed to allow that bidding to change. 
and as a result, they are saving 1.6 billion with a B dollars over three years on just the prescription benefits. So these are examples of what we can accomplish when we work together, when we have an honest broker on the other side of the table, when we are, are getting the information that we ask for, providing the information they ask for, uh, this is what we can accomplish together. Marie, let's talk, by the way, we're talking to Ed Richardson and Marie Bliston from the New Jersey Education Association, Steve Adubato, State of Affairs. Question, mm -hmm. uh, the Murphy administration, working closely with them, it's no secret that your organization worked hard to uh, help get the governor elected. In terms of the governor's proposals and his initiatives around, around school funding, mm -hmm. funding the school, state school formula, where are we and are we not where we need to be? Steve, we are in such a much better place today than what we were a year ago. I cannot underestimate that. We were living under eight years of underfunding by the prior governor to the tune of close to and nine billion dollars. Just respectfully, Marie, it's not just exactly the, the governor, right. it was the legislature both, as well. Both, but it does start at the top with an attitude and with a vision. And Governor Murphy promised us uh, during his campaign that he was very supportive of public education and he would make sure that that support turned into actions if he were uh, elected. And How's the dialogue different, Marie? Well, first of all, there is dialogue. We have been invited to the table. We have been invited to speak with him and his administration on all the matters that pertain directly to our members who are working in our classrooms, our school buses, cafeterias every single day. You know, one of the other issues that's important, and actually we were just uh, telling Ed and Marie that we, the Commissioner of Education was scheduled to be here today. There was a scheduling conflict. He will be joining us. Jackie Heyer, our executive producer, is going to make sure that happened. Our team is going to bring the Commissioner of Education. Why do I raise it? Because there's another issue that's important to all of us who happen to have children in, in public schools, the park test, mm. standardized park test. Mm -hmm. um, a few years ago, hey, this test has to be done. We have to know how our kids are doing. And we have to tie those results to how we pay teachers and how we evaluate teachers. Where are we today on that? And why is the commissioner of education so important, Ed? Well, you raised the connection to teacher evaluation, and the commissioner under the law does get to establish the uh, percentage of a teacher's evaluation that's attributable to student growth percentile, they call it. It's a it's change in, in the, the testing for that cohort right. of kids. Um, this was something that was in vogue when the law was passed, these value-added models. It actually was required in the past by the federal government. Everyone across the country is walking back from this. Hold on one second. Was this from the so-called, quote, no child left behind? Um, the in-between uh, Okay, there's policy. so many. Yeah. I'm sorry. <laughs> there's so, so many, the, the latest slogan, mm -hmm. but go right. ahead. So um, when the latest version of the federal uh, education law was adopted, they took that out. Why? Because these value-added models have essentially been debunked as uh, really kind of uh, bogus science. I mean, how you measure a teacher based on student standardized test performance? Exactly. And everyone from the PARC consortium to the company that created PARC has said that the test was never designed to be used this way. And so the commissioner correctly said, okay. Commissioner of Education. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, correctly said, I have the authority to establish uh, what percentage of the evaluation uh, this will be. I'm going to set it at the lowest possible what is percentage. It now? 5 is what he what said. What was it? It was 30. From 30 percent to 5 percent? Yes. Mm -hmm. And all of the research backs this up. He made an absolutely correct judgment about that. He also points out that only 17 percent of our teachers have this baked into their evaluations. And he correctly focused on the disequity that exists when you do that to just one in six teachers. Let me ask you about this. Mm -hmm. How important is this, Maria? You've oh, been in the classroom. Extreme. Look, I've been 30 years in yeah, the classroom. Yeah, tell folks real quick. I uh, taught the last 20 years at high school in Washington Township in Gloucester County. Prior to that, taught in Camden County, K-8 to district. Spent some time with middle school students, a little bit with elementary. You know teaching. I do. What about yeah. these tests? Uh, they absolutely need to go. Uh, we are supportive of any testing. And as somebody else has said uh, better than I have said, teachers invent a test. So testing is not the issue. Standardized testing? Standardized testing is still has, still has its place in our assessment system. Absolutely. What, park? But no. it does not have a, it does not have a connection to what we do in the classroom. So you asked me, what do we do in the classroom? I assessed kids every single day, multiple pass. I watched kids. I asked questions of kids. My idea and my focus to test a kid was not to catch a kid, but whether to see whether that child was learning the concept of where I needed him to be. If not, I was able to mm. readjust my teaching right then and there. 
And what she's Real saying quick, is... One more topic to bring up. Go ahead. Okay, what she's saying is so important because the Department of Education has proposed regulations to the State Board of mm -hmm. Education that will dramatically scale back the footprint of testing, uh, standardized testing. But one of the things that's ignored in that proposal is it will require timely reporting of those standardized test results to teachers and to parents for the first time. So we will all get to see, are kids doing well and in what areas do we need to try to uh, improve we'll what we're this. doing? Real quick, before I let you out of here, only a few seconds left. School consolidation, um, uh, say Senate uh, President Steve Sweeney is going to be here in just a little bit talking about his recommendations uh, that came from a task force. Okay, let's consolidate schools. We've Real always quick. said school consolidation should be with uh, the buy-in and agreement of all the stakeholders at the local level, should including Should be mandated by the state? I don't think that's a reasonable approach. Um, yeah. uh, our, our voters, our parents, and our educators need to weigh in on whether it makes sense. And whether it's good for students. That should be the number one exactly. question. How is this going to affect our children? Marie Bliston. Ed Richardson, the New Jersey Education Association. I want to thank you for joining us on State. Thank you for thank having you, us. Appreciate it. It's Anytime. Pleasure. Stay back. No, I'll stay here. You come back. We'll see you after this. I, I, it's only 30 years. I can get this right. <laughs> <laughs> to see more State of Affairs with Steve Adubato programs, visit us online at stateofaffairsnj.org. If you would like to express an opinion, email us at info at caucusnj.org. Find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash Steve Adubato, PhD. And follow us on Twitter at Steve Adubato. We are pleased to be joined once again by Dr. Robert Hodson, president and founder of uh, Road to Recovery. Good to see you, Bob. You too, Steve. I think Thanks. It's four or five times you've been with us. Yep. Your expertise, you're a former priest. Yes. You understand the uh, sex abuse scandal in the priesthood better than anyone else in the Catholic Church. We just had Senator Joseph Vitale check out that interview, who is calling for a uh, grand jury investigation. The Attorney General in the state of New Jersey doing the same thing into this case. Pennsylvania did, as you called it, what? I called some, uh, Philadelphia, or Pennsylvania, rather, a seminal study, seminal grand jury investigation. Because? Well, it, it left no stone unturned. It, it really looked into the depths of the crisis there. And found? And found 1,000 victims and 300 priests. And since the report was issued, hundreds have come forward to that same hotline. What do we need to do in New Jersey? <clears throat> By the way, New Jersey has a hotline. Check out our site. And Jackie, let's make sure we get that uh, website up, because people, dozens and hundreds of people are calling the Attorney General's website. Yes. Uh, Hotline on this. Yeah, I applaud uh, Attorney General Graywall for doing this. Uh, it has to be done. I've called for it for decades. Uh, as an insider for over 40 years in the church, I kind of knew what was going on there. And um, I know, you know, I was kind of like a voice in the wilderness for a while, mm. but now people are listening. And that's it's what has to be done. You know, it's interesting. I have never said this on the air before, but Ted McCarrick, um, the Archbishop of the Archdiocese I grew up in, um, elevated since then in the Catholic Church, in Metuchen, Archbishop there as well. He was an important uh, figure in my life, in my family's life. He was a spiritual advisor in my family. Yeah. Tell folks what he did. Well, Ted McCarrick ordained Allegedly me. Allegedly did. Well, he ordained me to the priesthood in 1997, but in 1994. Well, he did do that. Yeah. What, what was the word for a long time, according to many in the uh, church? Well, before we knew about his pedophilic behavior, we knew that he was sleeping with seminarians, and he would invite seminarians en masse to his Jersey Shore house in Seagirt, and he would always be one bed short, and someone would have to sleep with him. Uh, I'm currently working with a priest in Metuchen who uh, is still attempting to recover from all this. Bob, who knew about this in the church hierarchy? Everybody knew about it, Steve. Did now, the Pope know about it? I believe the Pope knew about know. it. You don't know. You think? I believe the Pope knew right. about it. I believe the Cardinals knew about it. There wasn't anybody who didn't hear about Theodore McCarrick's antics. Theodore McCarrick was a him. giant in the Catholic Church. Yeah. No yeah. one touched it. No one took it on. No, 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 because McCarrick was such a charismatic figure in many ways. He, he, you know, he was very socially uh, adept. You know, politically he, active. Politically engaged, active. Engaged, connected. Engaged. Right. When we, we've been trying to get the Child Victims Act passed in New Jersey, he called every legislator and told them not to do it, uh, and they believed him. He had juice, as we like to say, That's in New Jersey. Absolutely. And where are we now with him? Well, he's, he's now a disgraced figure. He's living on, you know, by himself, and he will, not get a, he will not get a cardinal's funeral. He will barely get a priest's funeral, if, if that. Too little, too late? 
oh, much too little too late. You know, in 94, when I applied to become a priest here, uh, I asked the question, is McCarrick still sleeping with the seminarians? What? Oh, yes, in 94. Uh, it was McCarrick who... 24 years ago as we do this program. Oh, yes. Yes. Uh, McCarrick asked me to speak to Monsignor Bill Fedrowski, who at that time was the head of catechetics for the archdiocese, because he had a similar story to me. I, he had been a brother. I was a brother. So he said, why don't you talk to Bill? My first question as we met in a little Spanish restaurant in Harrison was, Bill, has McCarrick stopped sleeping with the seminarians? I was afraid that I might be sucked into that because I had been abused yeah. previously as an Irish Christian brother. By the way, I was trained by the Irish Christian brothers, as you well know, at Essex right. Catholic and later at Iona. I too. Oh yeah. boy. Um, what do we need to do right now? We've got a couple minutes left. What do we really need to do? Get action. We need to hold these dioceses accountable. Uh, the, the Attorney General in Pennsylvania had, had a great uh, has a great plan, had a great plan, and, and did it. When he had to raid diocese files, he did it. Uh, if we need to raid, does the Attorney General of New Jersey need to be raiding files of diocese offices? I, I believe he does because we have what is called secret files, and those secret files contain the most important information for the most part. What about the statute of limitations? We have to get rid of the statute of limitations and hopefully do our best getting rid of it. There shouldn't be any statute of limitations on murder of the soul. We don't have it on murder of the body. Yeah. We shouldn't have it on murder of the left. soul. Minute left. What does Road to Recovery do? We work with sexual abuse victims and their families. We worked with over. We have worked with over 5,000 victims since 2003. 5,000. Yeah, N internationally. Church says, "Trust us on this. We'll handle it ourselves." No, the church cannot be trusted. It's it's been proven, <sighs> clearly proven. One more question that's personal for me and and more personal for many watching. Folks say, I'm torn by going to church because I don't know where that money's going. I, you know, it's hard for me to listen to a priest who's up there speaking because I don't know if he, in fact, was either engaged directly or was complicit in the process. Is that some wacky thinking? Well, I feel for the people because I don't think they should give up their faith. Right. As I tell people, my faith has never been stronger. Is faith in the church? Right. My religion has never been weaker, however, because I, I have a hard time dealing with those who are attempting to lead us in this religion. Uh, so what I would suggest to those folks is hold your church accountable, but continue, of course, to nourish yourself spiritually. Bob Oates and uh, Road to Recovery, and thank you for joining us. Thanks, Steve. Keep doing what you're right. doing to help yeah, a we'll whole do. range of people who have been victims and should never have been in the first place. We'll be right back after this. Thank you. To see more State of Affairs with Steve Adubato programs, visit us online at stateofaffairsnj.org. If you would like to express an opinion, email us at info at caucusnj.org. Find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash PhD. And follow us on Twitter at Steve Adubato. We are pleased to be joined by State Assemblywoman Eliana Pinter Marin, who is chair of the Assembly Budget Committee. Good to see you, my friend. Nice to see you, Steve. How are you? I, I'm great. I heard we are rolling in dough in the <laughs> State House. You don't even know what to do with the money. Is that true or is that fake news? That's fake news. <laughs> you must be talking about another state. What is the truth? Um, the truth tight? is, yes. I think it's been like this now. We've been talking about this issue for quite a few years. Um, when we're starting to have a little bit more of a restriction on the general fund, um, you start trying to identify areas that maybe you can cut and certain programs that we have to make sustainable. Let's so, make it clear. I'm sorry for interrupting. The Assemblyman is actually the chief person, the head person in the lower house in the state assembly dealing with all finance budget issues. Um, you, have, you listen to people come and talk about, hey, you need to, state needs to support our program. We're doing important things. There are people who are suffering. And you want to be responsive, but we have a massive fiscal problem. State Senate President Steve Sweeney, who's actually coming on right after you, says, you know what? We need to stop talking about raising taxes. We need to consider consolidating school districts and other communities. Um, and we need to deal with major additional cuts in health and pension benefits for public employees, you say? So this, this uh, uh, comes from our fiscal task force policy yep. did that you we- Did participate in it? I did. I did okay. participate on it with the Senate president. Um, and obviously, there was a group of ideas that, you know, um, policy analysts, ec uh, economists, uh, all of them uh, came together and identified quite a few areas that the state should look at 
and really consider uh, doing. Obviously, a lot of it is bold, uh, tough decisions. Uh, but I think that we're taking a look at some of these to see what, what can really what work. What happens if we do nothing? I think that that's not, we just can't afford to not do anything. What would happen? Uh, well, as I said earlier, our general fund is becoming more and more restrictive. Uh, we really can't afford to pay more taxes. And uh, we want to be able to keep our good New Jerseyans here and our college and people graduate from we're our colleges them. and stay here. We're losing them? We're losing them. Why? Like, why, why would someone, I mean, you're born and raised in this community, on board, like, we're not going anywhere. We're not the norm, are we? No, we're not the norm. But I also say that, you know, I think that more and more millennials are choosing to stay here in the sense mm. that uh, New Jersey is a, a great place to migrate to. Uh, we have trains, we have buses, we're so close to New York City. Uh, we have the best education system uh, nationwide, right? I think we're second. And uh, we just have to make sure that we can afford to live here. And I think that has become our biggest problem, is the affordability. Did you, when Governor Murphy and Steve Sweeney, the Senate President, were having spirited discussions, um, why are you laughing? Uh, had spirited, candid discussions behind the scenes on how to handle his budget, in all seriousness. Mm -hmm. A lot of Democrats were reluctant to want to increase any taxes. And the governor said, look. We have no choice. We have to increase taxes on the wealthiest New Jerseyans. I believe it was a millionaire's tax. I believe what was agreed to was over $5 million, Assemblywoman, that the increase would be, I guess, from 8.75 to, I'm not sure what the number 10. is. 10.75. What is it? To now 10.75. You say? Was that the right thing to do? So I think that at the end, we all wanted to have a fair and fiscal budget. I think that our main differences were really how do we get there? Fundamentally, we believed in the legislative add-ons, a lot of the programs that still exist today. Um, and I think that the five million piece was a good compromise, right? It's about compromise. Uh, I think that the Senate president and the speaker, which was very important for them. Speaker and obviously, Craig Coughlin. Right. And especially for my district as well, school funding. We put in a lot of money into school funding. We're really Why changing that. Why does that matter? So, why does that matter so much? And you know education more than more. She served on the... Uh, Board of Education as well. Yes. So why does it matter so much? It matters School so funding. Much. It matters so much because we have to find a way to start relieving some of that burden, not only on the state, but also on families that live uh, in New Jersey. And increasing that funding level, which... From the should... state to local school districts. Yes. And um, I think that, you know, in doing so, you're keeping our treasure, right? You're keeping what we uh, tout nationwide, which is our education system. Um, and you see that with even the preschool uh, funding, additional money that we put in there as well. Because you want to be able to maintain families here. You want to be able to tell people, why, do, why move away when we have everything that we need here? One more quick question um, on, on funding and kids and topic you care deeply about. Uh, an initiative we are doing is called Right From The Start NJ. The website will be put up as we speak, dealing with infants and toddlers and mm. the need to take care of those children and also moms, prenatal care, et cetera, et cetera. Are we doing enough? No. What should we do? So here comes back to our funding issue, right? Um, we have places in the state of New Jersey where we have deserts, I like to call them, um, of child care. And that's mm. from zero to three. Deserts of child care. Yes. Um, and that's because we don't have uh, enough of them. And the places that we do have that are very good, obviously, for low-income moms, um, it's very hard to be able to send your child to a great... Too expensive. Yeah, it's way too expensive. So what's the role of the state in this? How can the state help? Well, we did the child dependency tax, uh, which was one way to try to help alleviate. And I think that from this budget moving forward, it's about creativity. It's about where we can tweak um, some of the costs, what we can be creative in uh, creating sustainable revenue and new revenue. You know, we saw this, uh, it was kind of like the hallelujah, I like to, I like to call it, of the... Um, the sales tax, the internet sales tax come into play. Um, now we're talking about legalizing uh, marijuana, not only the, the medical side, but the recreational side. Should, excuse me, Assemblywoman. Uh, should some of those dollars, in a few seconds we have left, some of those dollars be dedicated to the early childhood issues that we're talking about, zero to three? Why not? Absolutely. If we, say, we often say they're our most precious resource, our children. Can we back it up? I think we do to a certain point, but not enough. And I think that this whole uh, child care piece has really been talked about within the last couple of years, and people are finally paying attention to it. I'm a mom of two young girls. Mm. Um, 
six and two. Beautiful. And, and I'm very fortunate. I have grandma and grandpa that are retired and help out tremendously. Not everyone has that. And not everyone has that. Not this everyone. This is personal for you, isn't it? It is personal because we want to make not only our children succeed, but we want to make our parents be happy, our constituents happy, and say, you know what, I love the state of New Jersey. Ms. I want to thank you so much for joining us on State of Affairs. Come back anytime. Thank you. All the best. Thank you. Thank you very much. Stay right there. This is State of Affairs. I'm Steve Adubato. We'll catch you next time. State of Affairs with Steve Adubato is a production of the Caucus Educational Corporation, celebrating over 25 years of broadcast excellence. State of Affairs with Steve Adubato is brought to you from the Agnes Veris NJTV studio at 2 Gateway. Funding has been provided by Englewood Health, the Northward Center, Rowan University, New Jersey Resources, the Healthcare Foundation of New Jersey, MD Advantage Insurance Company of New Jersey, and by International Union of Operating Engineers, Local 825. Promotional support provided by The Record, North Jersey's trusted source, and NorthJersey.com. And by Commerce and Industry Association of New Jersey. Choosing a new family doctor can be confusing. Check with your health insurer to see which physicians near you participate with your plan. Find out which hospitals the doctor uses and who covers when the doctor is away. And remember to schedule an appointment with your new doctor in advance to fill out any paperwork without the added stress of being sick.